an introduction because I think most of you know um, Steve and uh, I just have a quick story or two to tell. 18 years ago, we uh, decided to have a show called Soft Openings for this building because it had just been built. And we are trying to figure out, well, okay, how do we use this space? You know, the curved walls, and walls of glass, no right angles, uh, skylight, all the show, all the spaces kind of bleed into each other. How are we going to do this? This is not how I usually expected uh, museums to behave. Of course, if I had a say in it, uh, in the design, I would have ruined it. Because all the things that are wrong with it are what's right with it. It's a uh, you know, really beautiful, dramatic space. But the idea was to have about 10 artists experiment with the space and really sort of show us how to use it. So for the painter, I chose uh, Steve Kushner. And this was his room. And he had one painting that just about as big as that, right there. And, and that was our, our first uh, uh, wonderful show uh, <clears throat> with, with Stephen. Thank you so much for, uh, for participating in that. Mm -hmm. All the way back. I'm going to uh, just want to tell you one more thing. That is that the choir director here at American University was so blown over by the show that they are actually doing a concert based on these paintings and the idea of abstraction here in this space. So that's November 4th and November 5th. So if you want to come back and hear some music and enjoy the art at the same time. So I'm going to get out of the way and uh, I turn it over to George. Or, uh, well, I had, I had done, I had, uh, well, now I have two things that I want to say. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> first, I want to, uh, this is a thank you to Jack. Um, I met Jack in the spring of 1980. I don't know that he probably doesn't remember this, but I was, um, Finishing up graduate school up at the University of Maryland, and my, me and my friend Henry, we were we were graduating together. And we decided it was time to get our careers going. So we thought, well, we need to kind of approach some galleries in town and see if they would want to represent us. So probably we looked up our galleries in the phone book. Probably, and so we found one listed. The Jack Rasmussen Gallery, which I think was on 4th and Mass Avenue, or something. So Henry and I got in our
So when Alice came out, she flipped it over, she said, I love this stuff, I'm putting together a show with young Washington artists, and then two of you are in the show. <laughs> and that was the beginning of, that's the beginning of, of this. So thank you, you're you're thank welcome. you. <laughs> and then, just to amend, well, to add to the story that Jack told about the soft opening show here. So Jack called me and he said, pick out a painting. I said, well, do you want to come in and go? And he said, no, just pick out, just pick out a painting. Um, and some of you will come and pick it up like next Tuesday at, you know, next Tuesday afternoon. So I picked out a painting. I picked out the biggest painting I had. It was a painting that I did for David in exchange for designing a kitchen for us. <laughs> and um, at 1.30 on Tuesday afternoon, there's a knock on the door, knock on the door, and Jack is standing on the front porch with a big U-Haul truck parked across the street. Jack, was, Jack came to pick up the painting himself. So, there you go. So, thank you. The rest is just Maybe it would be nice if we didn't have to live basically in my studio. 
So I've known David for about 30, 30 years, and he had um, he built a kitchen for us about 25 years ago. And I thought, well, I don't know. Maybe David could come up with some kind of really grand, great working plan for us. And that was the that was the that I can I can go a little bit farther. So I called David and I said, you know, David, think about maybe you know building this again. And we had addressed this maybe 20 years ago, and then I was too cowardly to actually pull the trigger 20 years ago. So David came over and he sat in our living room, which was about 10 feet square. He looked at us and he said, you can't live like this. <laughs> so um, David is a, he's a magic talker. And George, I also feel, is a magic talker. So when they say things, I'm all in. I just am all under the stuff. So that was an impetus of the problem. And I have to ask you, David, before Steve approached you, have you thought about designing the studio for Steve? Well, there was, there was one when he chickened out about 20 years ago, but um, I thought it would be a great opportunity, but, but it was something that we hadn't talked much about in the last 20 years, I would say. And then they called and said, you know, we were interested in this. I think we had pizza in your living room, and then we had pizza again, right then we had in the backyard, and we talked about opportunities to be what could happen. You know, like, like the show is all about that. Here's this heroic work from this, this, this heroic guy. And, and I think he, I think from a pressure perspective, the old studio felt constrained to me. And uh, I think it was just a way to celebrate the work. And Steve, the client, would you come to David with a list of needs? <laughs> well, he, of course I did. You know, so the list included as much space as possible, given the small amount of property that we had. So as much space as possible. I, I already said this, I really wanted running water. I've never had a studio in my entire life that had running water in it. I was running up down the stairs or out in the hallway or whatever. So I wanted running water and I wanted it as big as possible. And we had a we had a a, a dollar amount in mind in that perspective. <laughs> that, was, that, that turned out to be the problem. So as much space um, and money water. That was it. We saw the back of the David, uh, tell us about fitting the studio in, in the setting between the house and the garage and the landscape. So so DC has this this new relatively new uh, accessory dwelling. So we were like, we're going to build every bit of that square footage. Uh, so we designed this project that was, was uh, constrained by that, as well as, I think, uh, 10 foot uh, canvas rolls. So we needed ceilings that could be 11 feet tall. Uh, we wanted paintings that could be 20 feet long. We needed a place to wash brushes other than the kitchen sink with them. And, uh, like that, and at the end of the day, it became this, this much like Steve's work. Like what's has spoken to me about Steve's work for the last you know, 30 years is, is the in between space of the objects are created within, within the gestural work itself. And you know, to me, that was the emphasis of what we wanted to celebrate with the new compound. And so there was the 1918 right? uh, bungalow that the original studio was on. I mean, we have the original studio into a family room space so the Cleveland Browns games can be celebrated appropriately. <laughs> and, uh, and then stretch the, the new studio as far back as possible. Well, interestingly, there was this garage that, that the district was like, well, you can't have that much square footage on the site. So we took this garage that really wasn't a garage, right? It was a place where you and Charlie would build uh, stretchers and firewood and lawnmower and things like that. We cleaved that thing in half. That's now called Building Three, I think is how you refer to it. And uh, you know, it's still a place for for stretchers and a lot more and fire with and such. But it's smaller, and it, and it sort of opens up, if you will, the in between space of the studio and the house. And uh, you know, that with a couple of some recycle work was was really what 
project. <laughs> so now you're in the studio. Now you're in the studio. You broke the studio in? Yeah, I broke it. I broke the studio in. Um, there are a couple of, of uh, art historical examples of people, you know, artists, painters in their studios. Um, Motherwell said that um, it would take six months to like get comfortable in a new studio. It's a limitation. 
I tend to think that the limitations are in strength. I mean, paint only does certain things and it doesn't do other things. Um, so the limitations are the limitations are built into the material. Um, there are others like you know how big is the room that I can work in and things like that. Those are kind of very relevant. Um, so once you get started painting, yeah, you can you can do anything you you can do anything. But I think we also, well, I can only speak for myself, we also like, create rules for ourselves. There are things that I don't allow myself to do um, because they seem like the right things to do and they, they fit me and my personality and the things that I'm looking for. But there are also a lot of things that I won't do, that I just, just won't allow myself to do. So those become limitations, but again, I also think they lead to the strength of work. So when you're working on a commission, um, what's your approach? Okay, so so I've only done I've only done maybe a handful of commissions. Um, when the first one was presented to me, I was a little hesitant. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a painting monkey. <laughs> um, but um, so the first thing I said to myself is, well, I'll you know if I'm going to do a commission, that's fine. But I will not do a painting that I'm not interested in doing. So that, that's kind of like the rule number one. Um, and then I kind of flipped the, the, what could be the limitations into, I think, the strength, which is, okay, well, here's a challenge that I wouldn't, I wouldn't arrive at on my own. So if somebody says, well, I'm interested in a particular color, or it needs to be a particular size, instead of going, oh, really should not be that color to this color. I kind of think about it, it's okay, well here's a color that I haven't used before, or I wouldn't naturally gravitate to. Okay, so let me see, you know, let me see what I can do with that color. And then the third, the third rule that I make for myself is I'm not going to let it out of the studio unless I'm totally satisfied. So I of course the client for me to be satisfied I can. But if I'm not satisfied with the painting, then, then I guess I'll, I'll well, I haven't, I haven't, um, I haven't had anybody send the painting back. But I have done, I have started paintings that haven't gone anywhere. So I just start the painting over and say, okay, well, you're going to have to wait, you're going to have to wait for the call. So even if the client commission will work, architecture or otherwise, you two guys and the masters, you're the decision maker. Absolutely. Absolutely. You've got to be the body. But I can only speak for myself. I am the boss of my work. That's 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 my that would be my focus. I am the boss of my work. I'm not the boss of really anything else. So <laughs> let me you know let me take a of that. So Steve, you would make you regardless of commission or otherwise, do you consider uh, architectural setting? No. <laughs> no. Wait, 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 wait. Um, the painting, I, you know, I think the, the painting is its own world. And so certainly working in the studio, that's all I'm seeing. I'm not seeing it next to or surrounded by or whatever. So all I'm concerned with is, okay, what's happening within the arena of that painting? And then, you know, David said before something about the field of dreams. I kind of agree with that too. You know, that um, I'll make the paintings that I want to make. And if nobody else likes them, that's okay. I need to like them. I'm, I'm, client, I'm client number one. And I think if, I assume that if I'm satisfied with the painting, there's a chance that somebody else will be satisfied. So, so David, sometimes clients must come to you with existing artwork collections. How do you handle that? Well, we start you know, early on with sense to seeing what that work is in terms of, of scale. Um, and if it's, if it's a collection, it's kind of relation, uh, relationships to each other. But I think, you know, Steve's right. Like, at the end of the day, the work should speak for itself. It should have a relationship with the client that's its own relationship. It has nothing to do with the environment that it's in. And, and I think, you know, all too often, 
this this uh, desire that the art and the furniture and the, just every component has to be so melded together. I believe uh, that the, I believe that, that architecture should challenge the client, and I believe art should challenge the client, and that, that if they're so harmonious at the end of the day, they, they don't have the ability to uh, to create that sort of dialogue. Personally, I'm from Washington. I realize that so a way that a lot of designers and architects, and one group was your group, which was well, art of a fundamental and on a spiritual relationship with the client. And that shouldn't be interrupted, bad or good. That's their thing. And it's different than buying a shape, for example. And then the, the others seem to want to build sets for people's living. For the living situation of people, particularly in Washington, under pressure, where they walk into their home and then anesthetized, it was so calming that there was no grist, no dialogue, rather. It was the setting to submerge their worries. Um, Steve, have you ever felt that the environment in which one of your paintings ended up was contrary or negative to the effect of the painting, the desired experience? Well, luckily, I rarely have a chance to see my painting, which mostly leave my, leave my studio. So I've been, I've, I haven't had to deal with it. I want to take the, take the client out of the conversation now. And without the client present, we started to speak about this before, what is your starting point in the house with the design? Interestingly enough, it, it rarely has anything to do with the site or with the client's desire. So, um, I, 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 I'm inspired by the hike in the woods. Uh, I, I came early to come, you know, be at one of the show, and you know, to me, there are uh, you know, there's a house in that painting right there, and. Um, you know, like, like you said, George, I grew up on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. What's interesting is, you know, my father was an accountant. We would travel to the, what was it, the CPA conference, like the architect conference every year. And those were always the big cities. And, and as a kid, um, I, I was always, you know, of the mindset, wrongly, that, that architecture only existed in these big city environments. And, and it was only after uh, being in, in, in school and um, architecture school and, and working here in town for Hugh Jacobson for a number of years that, that I realized that the, the place that I came from was so much more soulful often than the architecture of the cities. And you know, the space between Frank Perdue's chicken houses and these agrarian landscapes that, that uh, were, were just filled with these proud little buildings became inspirational to me in terms of their materiality. Steve's work speaks to me because I think a lot of my work is about that in-between space. And it's not the building itself uh, or a space within this, the building itself. It's, it's that spatial relationship to the next thing. And, and I think those, those are the emphasis of, of how I start. And, um, you know, my own house. Uh, I was at the Hirshhorn with my daughter. I think you guys know the story. And um, I, I forget who the artist in residence at the time was. But, uh, we were, Mackenzie and I were down there, and they, you know, she was probably like six. And I'd been thinking about this, this house. A tree had cut my Charles Goodman house in half in Bethesda. It was a fantastic house, and we loved it, but it was just, just destroyed. And it was like, you know, what are we going to do here? And, um, you know, it struck me that, that you know, the, the facade system of the house can become like a chameleon and reflect the landscape, and I didn't really know how to do that. And so we're, we're they had these blocks of foam and uh, aluminum foil and things like that. And so we, we made this sort of interesting shape, clad it in aluminum foil, and she had crinkled it up in a really interesting way and spray painted it black. And I took that damn thing home and I made a house out of it. And, and you know, today I look at it and I, I was with someone I think who photographed the project last week. And uh, he was like, no, you still have that little foam block from 20 some years ago that your daughter made. So 
I, you know, I find I find joy and pleasure. Elements in the homes you built. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I think we are, we at our best are creating vessels for life. We live. And I know in my, my own experience, every time I have uh, built a house or sold that house, the very first thing we do is, is hang art. And the very last thing we do is remove the art. And it's, it's you know, I like, I like to think, you know, that I'm not bad at what I do, but like, the work is not as good without the work of, of the art community involved in that. And none of these people are loving hearing that. <laughs> it's true. And some of that's relational, right? At the end of the day, like, I love Steve, I love Robin, you know, Sam and I talked every day for years. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to have a relationship with the art, it's a different thing to have a relationship with, with the creator. And, and to me, that's, that's, that's a gift that just keeps on giving. Like, Steve and I um, often send different things to each other. I um, mean, he, he knows I'm a big Michael Heights fan. And uh, it was when we were digging the foundations of his studio. Uh, he sends me this, and, and I was so proud of my guys. Like, they just carved this ziggurat of a footing around, and it was fucking perfect. <laughs> and then he goes, take that Michael Heights fan. <laughs> and it cost him nothing. Oh, no, it was probably like 300 to 400 bucks. My guys, it was probably worth 1,500 bucks. Not 15 bucks. Uh, Steve, I'm sure you see your paintings more than uh, Deborah Bell and the dark. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Um, you know, well, I think a painting is a, I mean, David used this phrase, I think, a, a full life experience. Okay? So, uh, painting for me is a full life experience. You know, for myself, I'm with it from the beginning. With it through all the hours of figuring out, figuring out the painting, trying to find the solution to the painting. So I am living with these things for weeks or months. So it's a full life experience. Now, when I was younger and um, more egotistical, I think I assumed that that's what a painting was for everybody. So any viewer of the painting would experience everything that I experienced and thought about and felt when they were looking at me. You know, I, I don't think that's, I don't, I no longer think that's possible. And, but early on, if anybody said, oh, well, it's just a, it's a decorative thing, I would have recoiled at that. So, well, no, it's, it's not. And, to the point where, you know, I, I don't think I'm much different than anybody else in my generation. If somebody liked your painting, then you thought you hadn't been working hard enough, right? So, but I accepted the fact that it can be a full life experience for me. It can be a full life experience for anybody who's willing to dive into this, okay? Um, but it's also a thing that hangs on the wall. At the end of the day, it is a thing that hangs on the wall. And so I guess the viewer can make of it what they want. I, uh, I had a professor in college, and I studied fine art, who uh, also taught interior design. And one day, when this argument was going on about decorative art, not decorative art, whether the fine art can be decorative, he said, well, you know, the Sistine Chapel, Fine piece of interior decoration. If I remember correctly, uh, I introduced Steve and David uh, to each other around 1993 94. Uh, they have been friends and supported each other for the 30 years that I've described. In addition to the friendship, they've had a long standing professional relationship. David, I understand that you suggested. Building a gallery of all of glass walls for viewing one painting. Well, we, we have this. this uh, yeah, it's true. Uh, <laughs> we have this, this uh, sort of every few months uh, posing questions to one another kind of relationship. 
and then he he's uh, so I was, you know I was one day I was like how do you you know so I was thinking about I I probably had asked him that I'd just been at uh, Philip Johnson's glass house in New Canaan and it struck me how that house was just simply a lens to the landscape and there was just one painting on a pedestal and and there was only the one right and then you go you walk further down the property and there's the painting that way. and it struck me as a challenge like you know if you were going to build this building that was all glass and just have one painting and how do you make that painting how do you make those decisions what are those pressures well i think you posed a, well first of all i thought you, this was actually a project that was going to be built so i was very excited but you <laughs> posed you posed the question this way well, they always are they always are Pose the question, what does a painting mean? Okay, so then you went on about, well, yeah, there's going to be this room, and there's going to be no walls, there's going to be glass. And could you, you know, I mean, the question was, could you do a painting for that room? Or could a painting exist in that room? And if so, how would it be different than if it was hanging, you know, in, you know, in a space like this? And I've been thinking about that question probably close to 25 years ago. I don't have an answer yet. <laughs> um, no, but what's interesting is I think there's this notion of art, architects and artists being selfish. Um, I, I was just visiting Carnegie Mellon with my son on his college visits, and I took Jake to falling water on the way back. And it was just a heavenly day. It was like this morning, and this was coming down, bare run was just flowing fabulously. And and it struck me, you know, we kept letting the tour guide get farther ahead, right? Because it's always more fun to have people just wanting to shepherd you along. But or not as fun. And so um, what struck me about being in Fallen Water at this time and thinking about this talk was how little right opportunity gave the opportunity for art to exist in that house. Right? Sure it's about the relationship between nature But, um, you know, it gives me the, you know, 
know, it gives me the you know, not the door permission. But the reason to the reason to do it. How about that? It provides a reason to do it. And I assume I'm I'm a, I'm naive and I'm idealistic and I'm trusting. So I believe that there are there must be other people out in the world like David waiting for these things.
you know, a board member of, or an able to have it all works together. Oh, okay. So, so I've been I've been teaching for a long time. Um, um, I've never stolen any ideas from students, so that was you know. So, so I'm not I'm not like poking around for oh there's a good idea. Um, what how it informs my work though is as a teacher your you know your job is to be articulate and to explain why you're asking the students to do this particular project. And then you also have to be able to explain and put into words that make sense um, why you're reacting in a particular way to somebody's work. Okay, so that's that was not something that I was very good at because I never had to do it before you. Once you stand in front of a class and you're like, oh, this is what the job is. What's Valuable then for me is it it taught me how to do that for my own. So you know, as a young artist, people say, "What are you doing?" Oh, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you know. That's pretty. Um, that's pretty amorphous. And if that's all you have, then it's hard to know. Well, is it being any good, or what am I trying to do? And so my the activity of teaching has kind of forced me to learn how to do that. Then I can turn that back to my. So hopefully I can speak a little bit more intelligently about what I am doing. But, you know, so out in public, but also for myself. So if I'm sitting in the studio and I don't know what's wrong with this painting, I can kind of uh, address it kind of concretely. There's that. The second part was about art enables, right? So if any of, so those of you who are not familiar with this arts organization called Art Enables, um, it's a studio for, um, artists with a variety of disabilities and um, it's in my neighborhood and I happen to be on the board. Um, was there a specific question about it? No, because it seems as though being in their space and seeing your artistic Sorry. Being in, the, being in that space and seeing you interacting with the artists there, it just, there was something special and I was wondering, I kind of, number one, I wanted this room to hear about her name a little bit just because it was incredible. If you haven't visited it, you should, you know, look it up and you should go visit it. It's a really special place. And, uh, um, and before I became a board member, I would go in fairly regularly and I always left with a painting or a drawing under my arm. So I would always buy, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go and not come home with something. The work is just, it's just wonderful. It's delightful and it's whatever. Um, so then working on the board, I had the opportunity to go in and work with artists on projects. And um, they have, well, well, okay, how about this? They have no excuses. They come to work, they, they, they think about it and approach it as a job, which it is. And they come to work and they, they have no excuses, there's no complaining, you know, there's a lot of that with college students, I'm not in the mood, right? Uh, you know, I'm a little hungover, oh, I left my paint at home. We've heard all those excuses. You walk into this the Art and Able studio, they are there, they're working, they got their materials, they got their ideas. Oh, it's time for a, a, a coffee break, we take a coffee break, and we go back to work, and then it's lunchtime, and then they go back to work, and, and it's just, it's just wonderful, it's wonderful. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Yeah. Photograph that in 
that spring when the uh, mono block of flocks between the studio and the house has emerged. And the color of Steve's pants. <laughs> Steve, do you work on one painting at a time or a show? Uh, I work on, on, on uh, 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 several at a time. I can tell you that my sweet spot is five. So if I have five paintings going at any one time, um, usually one painting is getting near completion, and I always like to have one that's just starting. I also like to have an empty canvas ready in case something. Oh, here's a, here's a good idea. Um, if I have less than that, so if I only have two or three, I get anxious. And um, to fill my time, I feel like I have to force decisions. Never been to look at. Um, if I have more than six, I get distracted. I don't know which one to grab all of them. So I have, the sweet spot is five. Um, and then I also do a lot of work on paper. So there's a lot of work on paper here in the show. So I usually have other things going on. And depending on you know, how much energy I have that day. So some days I have a lot of energy and I can attack a painting like that. But there are some days where I don't know, I, you know, whatever, I didn't get enough sleep last night or whatever. And I don't, I don't quite have it to, you know, so I do that. The work, the, the work on paper and the work on pens, they feed each other, they feed each other. Um, this isn't your question, but lots of people want to know about uh, works on paper. Studies for paintings, more often than not, they come after the paintings, so they kind of bounce back, they kind of bounce back and forth. Um, Steve, I have a I'm always struck by what I imagine must be the real physical challenge of making these big canvases. And I'm just curious if they on the wall, on the floor, on the table, or how do you execute um, them? Um, I, I do them all on the wall. Um, sometimes I stretch the canvases first, and then I work on painting. More often than not, I just stretch the canvas right on the wall, and whatever it grows into. That's the size of the painting. I know I can work on the floor, and I think about it all the time, and I'm tempted all the time. But at the end of the day, it's just you know, it's kind of this is this is painting for me. This is painting for me, and that's not that it's not painting that for me. So I said before about things that do that I will allow myself to do or not allow myself to do. There are all these kinds of things that are possible to do, but I only do the things that. Right. And I'm more comfortable working large, so the physical part, uh, it, it feels like, and I find them easier to do. This is actually, well, it's harder for me to resolve a small painting, usually. It's also harder physically to do that. I kind of, you know, it's like, you know, his muscles kind of move on, you know. But as Steve gets a little more mature, it's, we did put a hook in the top of the studio so that we can swing him you know, back and forth <laughs> to, to really get some good pendulum movement on these things. And that was, a, that was, a, that was uh, one of the good architects' ideas. That was <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think we can have them a better night than the image of Steve swinging. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I'm 